So, um, yeah, I think this sustainability thing seems to be taking hold. Um, it's not just our shows, but the fact that we now have a sustainability committee in the building, um, that's very exciting. And I'm looking forward to seeing that sort of growing from the bottom up. Um, and I'm also lucky to have um, been off offered the opportunity to sit on the sustainability committee for the whole of the Smithsonian. And I'm going down to DC next week to see what that's like. And I'm hoping that may give us an opportunity to sort of think more from the top uh, level as well with the scientific and research resources that they have in the institution. Um, so it's tremendous uh, opportunity this afternoon to start with a very super high level top down knowledge approach from Rick Cook in that he's done so much, you know, he's already been exposed in many places with PBS and lots of different uh, places where he's talked and we're very lucky to have him here to set us up and get us going, um, both from examples and uh, from knowledge base. So thank you very much. Over to you, Rick. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here. There's a personal connection here, but also with the museum. I'm, I, I can't help when I talk about design um, to talk from a perspective of a personal experience, because I think design is a really personal experience. So uh, what I'm going to do is walk through and, um, and talk about something that many of us call the conversion experience. Like, How did we come about this work, and why is it important? And is it about carbon footprint, or recycling, or what is this whole thing really about? And um, what I found is that uh, the people who I call the good guys in the movement all have, and non-gender specific, of course, but uh, all have some conversion experience where they kind of got it. What, what's the meaning to me personally a, about the work? So what I'm going to do is show a couple of projects that expose me to it and try to knit the story together and make it personal for each one of you also. So if you bear with me, I'll go through, uh, I'll go through a series of projects. My, my first um, experience with a green building design was this building called the Center for Wellbeing that had all the kind of new agey stuff. It was out in East Hampton for, uh, for philanthropists, amazing modern art collection. So I'm a young architect thinking like, this is really great. But the story there was that it was just a way of doing architecture slightly differently. It was a way to green up the architecture. And it wasn't part of my conversion experience. But I'll show you that project really quick. I uh, had become a, a Bible student. And had this opportunity to go and speak with uh, the founder, Courtney Sale Ross, about this building called the Center for Wellbeing. And this was um, an idea about, about education, which is training the global citizen of the future, uh, Eastern and Western concepts of health and fitness. And I just I happened to be reading the book of Jonah, and I said, ah, Jonah's whale. This is a place of transformation. And I, in those days, architects wore ties a lot, and I decided I'd never wear a tie. And I went in, and I drew this sketch of the belly of Jonah's whale, and I said that was the idea for the building. And she said, good, let's build it. So, uh, so that's how the whole project kind of started. It turned into this project and the ribs of the whale where the giant glue lamb beams and of course all the materials were rapidly renewable and didn't need treatment. It was completely heated and cooled by geothermal, used bamboo flooring, all the kind of catch words that you see in the green movement. This is about um, now about 12 years ago we started the design, the design process. Um, but what was really interesting was she was very focused on training the global citizen. And she thought that in the United States we had a very Western-centric view on education. So here, this is the Eastern dining balcony. You literally take your shoes off when you come in. And we started to, we started to explore these ideas. We both agreed that architecture had been obsessed with the visual, but we really experienced buildings with much more than our visual senses. We, we remember what our grandmother's house smelt like. We remember what things hear like, what, what they sound like, and we remember what they, what they feel like, what they touch. What's, what's a beautiful thing to touch? And what's a nice smooth, like a beach stone versus a piece of glass? So the you take your shoes off, the tactile feedback when you first get in, the library was completely dispersed throughout, so you could teach in each one of these dining balconies. She had a beautiful textile collection, so we were saying as architects we could weave light and shadow into, in, into part of it. Um, all the children did tai, and the teachers all did Tai Chi together. The food was organic. They recycled everything. Everyone scraped their own plate. 
And, uh, and of course, one of the things that we're really interested in was what did it sound like? Not just what does it look like and what does it feel like, but what does it sound like? So we created a meditation room where you could, it was so isolated and had this reflective dome, you could hear your heartbeat if you, if you sat there long enough. Um, we put the cafe on the second floor, which is in a school completely nuts because you have to double handle everything. But the only reason we put it on the second floor was that the windows could open and you could hear the birds in the trees. And that, over, that was a, a completely overriding concern to the double handling of the freight. So this, this uh, thought about architecture is generally grouped under a term called biophilia, which was coined by a biologist named named uh, E.O. Wilson, and she had a little framed picture of E.O., although I don't remember using the term biophilia at the time. Um, so that's not my conversion experience. That's my first exposure to the green movement, and my partner now, Bob Fox, was doing a building called the Condé Nast Building Four Times Square, which was coined the first green skyscraper in America. Then um, we have the project that I, that I said that I felt I was born to do. Um, this is a project down in Front Street. And uh, this is a photograph by Bernice Abbott. Much of the work that we do in landmark districts, we search to see if she ever took a picture of that location, because in some way, she captured the sense of the place. And she spoke uh, very specifically about 1936. This is the Theo line. She said it was the last great wood sailing ves vessel pulling up to what was New York seaport that had moved around to the west side. So it's a collage of the naval architecture, these small scale warehouses, and the metropolis behind. Um, Melville sets um, Ishmael out from these very streets. This was New York's uh, seaport, and that buildings, um, buildings can connect to a place, or they could have context which is relevant that is no longer tangible. I mean, we literally wrote on the buildings in kind of a graffiti, so these, this quote is on one of the buildings down there. Um, this, is, this is the project, the, the Brooklyn Bridge that you see here, and the Seaport Historic District. So it was uh, an entire block that had been abandoned. It was in these kind of funeral shrouds of scaffolding and, and, uh, and netting, and it had been under municipal control for quite some time and been uh, collapsing, called it a romantic state of collapse. But one of the things that that did was allow a sense of authenticity that no other place I'd ever seen in my life had. Um, that there was something about the, the land that time forgot. We sent a photographer friend down there to take pictures to try to capture that and uh, capture the ghosts of the place. So this is one of the painted graphics that hadn't been overburnished. these small fragments of paint that, that were still there. Um, the other thing we wanted to do is make sure that um, it wasn't it wasn't uh, a new project in a historic district that was insensitive to the fine-grained nature of the block. So this was a big parking lot right here. And uh, this was a parking lot here, and this was a parking lot on the corner. So we designed it so that you could enter into these courtyards um, where the barrel makers were and the, and the cisterns were, and enter the buildings um, from the side so all of the street front could be retail, which is what these buildings were. They were counting houses and lofts. They didn't have entrances to lobbies on them. Um, so this is the uh, existing fabric from here to here and from there to there, and this was uh, where the parking lot was. So we're very interested in creating a scale and texture and rhythm that sat well on the, on the street. Uh, and not over burnishing um, what was there. So we found the project like this with uh, netting over some of the buildings, and the idea was how do you how to restore this place without over burnishing it. How do you leave these ghosts of history? And we worked with some engineers to invent something called mortar, mortar injection to try to keep the facade so we didn't have to repoint it or over burnish the facades. Um, leaving the building on the left the way that it was and uh, doing new buildings next to it and somehow respecting the ghost of what was there. I mean, most people know, knowing this area can picture the building that must have sat here at one time. So this ghost is uh, remaining in the corridors of one of the buildings. And uh, so this romantic state of collapse, I, I just love this engraving because it shows what these buildings were. They weren't apartment houses. They weren't office buildings. They were clearly store and loss. And uh, when I look at this, I think of the saying, pack to the rafters. Um, and this is a, one of the building collapses in the, in the neighborhood. The buildings were also collapsing and falling down um, when we found them. Um, this is one of the buildings that had been braced for a while and then ultimately collapsed. 
And Peck Slip, which is one of the streets, was literally a slip. The piers both went out and pierced into the land mass. And uh, our inspiration for one of the clean sites was the thought that these great wood sailing vessels would have come right into the streets of Manhattan. So um, that's what that's what this is. And we, get, we had the opportunity to design a new facade here and a new facade right here. And, uh, and that's one of the new buildings. Obviously, a building looking back out to the sea. And uh, so the, the reason that this project was in the National uh, Building Museum's exhibit, the Green House, really had to do mostly with the fact that it was completely heated and cooled from geothermal um, heating and cooling. And uh, that is kind of a list of an attribute, like, oh, that's interesting. It's green because of this. But I would say it's, it's the least interesting green feature of the project, although it's a cool technology. There's 10 wells that go 1,500 feet deep into the ground. So there's 10 wells that are each deeper than the Empire State Building is tall, which provide the heating and cooling. For us, really, the motivation was to keep the big cooling equipment off the roofscape of these very fragile uh, early 19th century buildings. Um, so al alluding to the whale, the fluke of the whale tail from Moby Dick, the relationship with uh, the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, providing uh, new housing at a low scale connected to the streetscape. So there's nothing more beautiful than the, in my opinion, than the Brooklyn Bridge. So when you're inside the building on the corner, looking back out to the Brooklyn Bridge and creating different types of housing. Um, also the conversion of the lofts into new housing. This project used Liberty Bonds done in that period of time right after um, September 11. And then creating a whole new streetscape. So the greenest thing we can possibly do is dense urban living and reusing sites and previously disturbed sites and thinking about the fabric that was left to us and how we insert new design and reuse existing, existing buildings. Although the, the geothermal well technology is the thing that probably got us in the greenhouse exhibit, there are many other things that I think are a much uh, deeper version of green that are going on in the project. OK, so now my conversion experience. So these two projects are going on, and they have interesting green things. And I'm thinking, you know, as an architect, I think most of us deal with our own issues of, of egocentricity. And we think, you know, somehow this is going to make us cool and get us into museums like this. And, uh, but what I really think the difference was for me was that I was starting to read much more about what the issues were globally. And uh, so we're an adoptive family. And uh, I think when you really start to think about stewardship and generational thinking is, is through the lens of parenthood. Uh, so my sons uh, were born, our sons were born in Poor Sot, Cambodia. And we're in a little, the orphanage that you see back here. And so we travel in 2001 um, to become a family. And uh, we were in one of those little tour buses. We were kind of one of those stereotypical families, all the little, the new adoptive parents on their way to the orphanage. And we we're in this little tour bus. And it turned off the road to go to the orphanage. And I took this picture out of the right-hand side of the van, which brought up a lot of issues. Like, yeah, the developing world, they can really get it right. They have air cooling, tied to agriculture, uh, water retention. They can really get this right. And we've totally messed it up post Industrial Revolution. Well, at the, ex at the exact same moment, out the other side of that little van, uh, well, this is, a, this is the Phnom Penh SUV. At the exact same moment, out the other side of that van was this image. So out one side, that kind of perfect primitive hut, and out the other side is choking congestion. The, the vehicles, a lot of them are using two-stroke, unrefined gasoline sold out of little pe Pepsi bottles. And we know what this leads to. Right? We know the pattern that they're racing towards. So, um, so the issue is, what do you do as a developed world who now think you kind of get it about the green movement and talk to the developing world who want everything that we have, the health care that we have, these things that we have? I mean, how could you say you need to slow down? So this was really very much on my mind. And uh, in Rene Dubot in 1972, working for the UN, uh, coins the term uh, think globally, act locally. Probably the most 
overused term of, of the green movement. But it was 1972, so I grew up with this in the back of my mind. In fact, Lucy Commoner's dad, Barry Commoner, is on the cover of Time magazine for the, it was the first Earth Day, I believe. Right for the first Earth Day, Rachel Carson. These are giants in uh, in the environmental movement. And uh, being a 50 year old person, I grew up in the late 60s and early 70s hearing all of these. So um, now, as an American, I come back and I'm like, as an American, we're less than five percent of the world's population. We consume almost 25 percent of the world's resources. We produce about 25 percent of the world's CO2. We're the gluttons at the global banquet table. So, okay, that's that's not good as an American. But as an architect, then, what's the, does this have to do with this? So most people say anywhere between a third to 45 percent of all CO2 emissions um, come from buildings. And then 32 percent from transportation, 25 percent industry. The stuff we make and how we plan to do it has a huge impact. So now as an American architect, totally on the hot seat. Like, wh What do you do with this information? Um, in New York City, the plan why, uh, Plan YC attributes 79%, approximately 80% of all CO2 to buildings. So if we're addressing climate change, and Plan YC uh, lays out a plan for a 30% carbon reduction by 2030. That might not seem very aggressive. That's taking three Phoenix, Arizona's carbon neutral. Like just to understand the scale of New York City. So taking New York City carbon neutral, 30% uh, reduction is three Phoenix's carbon neutral. All right, so the, the think globally, act locally. I, I had this uh, incredible uh, blessing. So I'm a kid from upstate New York, lived on a cul-de-sac in suburbia. And we have the opportunity to be the architects for um, a project called the Bank of America Tower at One Bryant Park. The Durst family had been acquiring this site right here uh, since 1967. So this is the New York Public Library. That's Bryant Park, Times Square back here, four Times Square that the Durst developed, first green skyscraper in America. Uh, they happened to own 11, uh, 1133 and 1155 also. So we had this incredible opportunity. So now what do you do? American architect has the opportunity to work on this parade of champions. So um, we always go back to see if there's something about the place, the history of the, of the place um, that, that we think is relevant. So uh, this is where the New York Public Library is now, Croton Reservoir. Behind it was Reservoir Park. And in 1853, we built the exhibition for the industry of all nations um, after Paxton's Crystal Palace in London of 1851. Um, this view was supposedly taken from something called the Ladding Observatory. So the site we're talking about is right here. This is 6th Avenue, 42nd Street, and 5th Avenue. This earthen Egyptoid uh, thing with this uh, uh, water retention inside of it. And uh, the Crystal Palace, the first metal frame and all glass building built in America. Mark Twain said of it, beautiful beyond description. Um, Walt Whitman wrote an entire poem about it. So. Uh, inside of it, this guy right here, Alicia Graves Otis, uh, exhibits the safety brake on, uh, on the elevator. You can see somebody cuts the cord right here. The safety brake kicks in. He says, voila, people are amazed. And uh, some scholars say that this is really the tipping point for the skyscraper age. We knew how to make buildings tall. We didn't know how to get people up and down in them safely. Within a year, Alicia Graves Otis um, gets the first contract for a passenger elevator. So we, um, we have a clean slate. The Henry Miller Theater, now uh, renamed the Stephen Sondheim, is on the site. Two million square feet is a very large, um, is a very large block, block of space. Um, we knew that we wanted to have this low scale that related to 42nd Street and the base at the, Con at the Condé Nast building. So the, pr the project was just officially opened, even though people had been in there for two years, um, using the highest performance clear glass that you possibly could, looking back out to Bryant Park and uh, onto green roofs that are down here in this one acre space in between the two buildings, the faceted portion of the building to, to essentially look around the cereal boxes that are there and get views out to the ocean and uh, back to Times Square and around the boxy buildings which are around it. 
Um, that's the building sitting on Bryant Park with this canopy, deep canopy, so we could use very clear glass. Due south is pretty much across the park right here. And there's a deep, what's called a deep double wall technology in this portion of the building. And then the, the story here is that uh, we get asked, uh, so what's so green about a giant skyscraper in the middle of Manhattan? Well, forget the LEED Platinum status under the US Green Building Council, LEED rating system. I, I don't know if you all know about that. but So this is the highest uh, level that you could get. Forget all of that. A dense urban building, 2.2 um, million square feet, not one parking space. It lives and breathes off the mass transit system. And, uh, and this is a, a new glass enclosed subway entrance uh, that you can get out of this undercover and enter into the building. Also, the project was large enough to fund a below grade connection that when the TA does their half, it will connect the BD, V, and F and the Times Square line for the first time. So um, probably why? why people want to hear about this project is what were the advancements? What makes the project green? And at this point, we're really thinking, what's free? What does nature provide free? And what can we deal with? So we looked at sun, rain, bioprocesses for anaerobic digesters, um, earth as a, as a heat sink, wind turbines. We were sure the project was going to have a wind turbine. In, fa in fact, in the early models, you can see the wind turbine was here. And we knew the big answer, because of the scale of the project, it could do something called on-site power generation or co-generation. Um, this is what I was just speaking about with the uh, connection between the two pieces. So like, what is green design? I have a hybrid car. It, it make, it's, makes no difference. A hybrid car is a little bit better. It's still bad. Mass transit is the answer. We have 1.4 billion riders on the New York City subway system. And a project like this can reinforce the infrastructure. All skyscrapers kind of live and breathe off the, off the city's roots. Um, we get a tremendous amount of rain in New York City. So the Condé Nast building, first green skyscraper, did nothing with water. We, we're blessed with a remarkable water supply system here. And uh, the Dirt just decided, why don't we attack water on this too? Because most of the world views water as a precious, precious resource. We just happen to have a very, very good supply. All of the things that we did there were, um, it was important to create a financial payback because that was part of the story that would be told that even a, a financial institution, this is before the recent banking crisis, that the bank would make smart decisions and would only do things that made financial sense. The water was the one exception. It didn't really make any sense. The payback was over 10 years. But we get 48 inches of rain in New York City. Um, so we decided we could capture uh, technically every drop that falls on the site and stage it in a series of tanks in the building and uh, reduce pumping pressure, pump, uh, pumping energy by using the static pressure of the st uh, potential energy of, of stage tanks. And what most people don't realize is that uh, we evaporate a tremendous amount of water to cool our buildings. We use evaporative cool and cooling towers. We make buildings sweat. And we use tremendous amounts of potable drinking water to cool skyscrapers. That's what we do all across, the, all across America. So by storing all of that water and using it for cooling tower makeup, we were able to reduce the water usage of the building by over um, 50%. So as a designer, I never, ever thought I could stand in, in front of the Cooper Hewitt and talk about wireless journals. But we, I was literally saying, Bob, I can't talk about wireless journals. I'm, I'm a designer. And then literally did the back of the napkin calculation and realized that by using waterless urinals in this, uh, in this building, it would save about 3 million gallons of water. OK, so that's pretty good. And before my partner banned the little uh, half liter bottles of water, we used to have them sitting around all the time. And so we're saying, how many of these little suckers is it? And we, so we did the calculation. It's 22 million of those little half liter water bottles. So then we said, how how could we possibly tell people how many 22 million is? Well, it's 2,929 miles of those little bottles end to end. So they're like, that's, that's pretty far. It's enough to go from New York to San Diego in water bottles by changing one technology in one building for one year. Right? So there, there are little crazy things that, act, that really can make a difference. OK, so the big story is energy. So a lot of the stuff I didn't know, also what I forgot to say, is why stormwater capture? Why is that important? I had no idea that this was true. But in most of New York City, as little as one-tenth of an inch of rain overflows our combined storm and sewage treatment plants. And we pump raw sewage directly into our rivers. 
right? Just profoundly dumb. And so every building, like, has to do this. We have to stop overflowing our sewage treatment facilities and pumping raw sewage in, in there. It's, it's easy. It's just stopping and thinking about it. OK, so in America, um, what happens is we, on average, we put an energy source into a plant. We waste about 2 thirds of that energy and waste heat up the smokestacks and about another 7% in transmission losses. So by the time we plug in, like we are here, all across America, we're using about 27% efficient power. So what's the big deal with on-site power generation? We have a 4.6 megawatt on-site power generation facility that captures uh, technically uh, all of the waste heat, reuses it, and has no transmission loss. So we'll produce about two-thirds of the building's annual energy use on-site at about three times the efficiency of the grid. Now, that's, that's good. But the other thing is the cogen produces more energy at night than we need for the base load of the building. Um, oh, so why is that good? So why should we care that the Bank of America is saving more than half of their energy cost? Because in, New York, in the New York regional area, we, use some, we have something called peaker plants. And so most of the office building loads, they peak way up in the afternoon. Think 2000 and April. August 14th, 2003, we had our big blackout. It's kind of typical mid-August mid peak loads. So there's a base load and there's a cooling load. It peaks, and at night, office buildings use very, very little. It's probably similar in museums, although you're, you're trying to keep a more constant temperature. So, the, so what happens is when we reach that peak, they turn on something called peaker plants. We pay for a bunch of very, very dirty power plants to sit around unused. We, we pay typically private energy providers to have staff on hand all the time to not turn on a power plant. And that when we reach that peak load, we call up and say, you better, you better go online. And they start turning on these, these peaker plants. That's why we get beautiful sunsets in, uh, in August. So 90% of the smog is produced by 50% of the power plants. We have very clean power plants. We have very dirty power plants. Every building can clip its peak load. I don't know, do we have the ice here? Yeah. So one of the things that can work on any project, ours worked particularly well because we had the, uh, the on-site power generation producing energy, but to reduce that peak load, you can actually freeze water and store up cold when the energy is very plentiful. It's being produced by cleaner energy. And in fact, it's much, much cheaper to uh, use energy at night than during the peak load if you're a commercial building. So we have 44 of these 10-foot uh, diameter ice storage tanks down the basement. These are the ice storage tanks being loaded in. Um, so there's the things. We, we went way past 35% recycled content. But these are kind of that list of attributes. And I'll, I'll come back and talk about what, what's relevant or not relevant. But I think marketplace transformation is a lot more interesting. So um, Battery Park City, um, my, my partner was involved in authoring the green design guidelines for Battery Park City. So they, they say you have to use uh, 35 or 40 percent blast furnace slag or fly ash concrete, which is a waste product. Cement. Cement and gypsum are the two largest CO2 producers in the world. Depending on who you talk to, pr production of cement globally produces anywhere, depending on who you talk to, between 5 percent and 9 percent of global CO2. Every ton of cement that's produced produces one ton of CO2 in the atmosphere. So Battery Park City says that you have to use this. The Concrete industry, picture it right now, New York City concrete industry. And it's exactly like you're picturing, right? They, they don't want to change what they do. And uh, so they go ahead, they mandate it. It was about 2 or $3 more per square foot to use fly ash or blast furnace slag concrete. By the time we did uh, the Bank of America Tower, it was less than a dollar per square foot more expensive. So we produced 45% uh, blast furnace slag concrete, which that one technology change saved 56,250 tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. It looks just like anything else. So whether it's Design or not is another whole topic of conversation. But the marketplace transformation is, is not debatable. So we do another project later on for a pure developer who did a green label because that was the thing that you had to do or you're going to design an obsolete building. This developer really couldn't care less, personally, other than how do you sell condos. And we achieved 50% blast furnace slag for no additional cost because the marketplace, the concrete industry, liked it. They figured out how to do it. It set up faster and stronger, so at no cost. So it, uh, getting out ahead actually transformed the entire marketplace. 
Um, so are you chasing after lead points? Or are you trying to rethink the way you do things? This is really the story. So one lead point for 50% construction debris or demolition debris, two points for 75%. But if you set out to do it right, there's no reason why you can't do essentially all. So we have documentation for 91%. And, and that's good. But because the Durst family and, uh, and everyone on the team actually cared, um, pallets, these shipping pallets come. If those were thrown in a dumpster, crushed up for wood chips, and imagine how many of, of the wood spools were that they wrap wires on for a skyscraper. Imagine how many are there. If they threw them in a dumpster, crushed them up, it all would have counted. We could have done just enough, got the two points, everything would have been fine. But instead, we're like, these are pallets. They, we can reuse these guys. And you know why we don't do it in New York City? The construction managers say there's no room. We can't store them up. Nobody wants them. There's no way. So somebody who cares starts making some phone calls to the pallet guys. And the guy said, I have to buy pallets. So I just won't come and get 10. I won't come and get 20. I need a, I need a truckload of pallets. And then we go to the spool guys. And somebody puts a, cool, uh, a call to the people who wind the spools. And I said, I'd love to get them back. They're expensive. But I'm not going to come and get five. I need a truckload of them. So we go back to the construction manager and say, we need this much square footage to take these things away as pallets and as spools. And they say, no way. There's not enough time. And then there's the client. Everything comes down to individual personalities. Douglas Durr said, make room. And that's it. So now the pallets went back as pallets. Spools went back as spools. One person just said, make, make room. OK, um, so all of those things are all good, it's kind of interesting, power, water, these are important. But the real answers in a workplace are the people. So um, energy, if you look at the cost of running a company, it's a very, very small energy. It's very, very small sliver. So if we cut it in half, we didn't really do very much. People are really expensive. On almost every company in almost every company in the world, it's between 75% and 90% are people, their salaries and their benefits. So if we rat, just look at the chart, if we cut the energy in half, we made a buck difference. If you made a 1% rise in productivity somehow, that would really that would really be much bigger. So at the Bank of America Tower, we realize a 1% rise in productivity is five minutes a day in a work week. And uh, so radically cutting the energy, this is all pre-banking crisis. So radically cut the cost of energy, 3 to $4 million. In those days, nobody's looking up from their BlackBerry. They're paying a 28-year-old bond trader a $3 million bonus. But talk about a 1% rise in productivity. Just 1% was worth more than three times as much. So how in the world could you do that by designing an environment? First of all, air quality. And I would think that uh, those of you who are conservation, you know, involved in the conservation of textiles and, and collections, you already have a total sister. I mean, you, the things you protect are very sensitive to the same things that I believe human beings are sensitive to, volatile organic uh, compounds. Most of this stuff is loaded with ure urea formaldehydes, which off-gas into the, into the environment. They, they might be. Um, invisible, but they're very much real. So how do you do that? You, do you do gas phase filtration? We also uh, filtered out with something called a MERV-16 filter, 95% of all the uh, particulates. So pretty much picture a clean room or an operating room or a computer in installation for the work environment in the building. The other thing is the number one complaint in every office building in America, I'm too hot, I'm too cold. Like you've seen it, the, lo you know, the, the padlock on the thermostat, somebody. And this is really hard for us. So you have facilities. I don't know if anybody here is involved in the direct op operating of, of the building. But you get somebody who says, I'm burning hot over here. This is ridiculous. Can't you fix it? And right next to them is somebody who's wearing a sweater and freezing. So human perception of comfort is, is, uh, is another interesting thing. So the idea is you give people individual control. So what this is, what that thing I was just looking at was uh, a swirl diffuser in the floor. And essentially, every employee in the Bank of America Tower has an individual control. Um, the other thing is that, uh, and this was done a lot in Europe, but uh, we typically supply air overhead and through a little magical thing called a diffuser. And it mixes the cold air, also all the dust, the pollens, the sneezes. And it's very democratic that way. So what the, what the building has is underfloor air um, displacement. 
So that means the air conditioning is coming under the floor at, uh, at a warmer temperature. Overhead, it's typically about 55 degrees. And if you get 55 degree air blowing directly on you, you're cold. It doesn't feel good at all. That's why it's mixing all the dust and pollen. 65 degree air directly on you is much more manageable. And then giving each person their own control. And, and it uses uh, natural principles. Hot air rises. We're hot. Our computers are hot. So there's a plume of air around us constantly rising. And by doing that, it displaces air and it creates a vacuum below it. So you can provide air on the floor with much less fan energy because the vacuum that's being created by your own plume of air. And it's also your plume of air versus the person next to you with the sneeze. Um, so what, we're look, what we just looked at, it, it jumped ahead, was the difference between four times square, the first green skyscraper, and one Bryant Park, a little animation that we did. Um, so with the raised floor, it allows the heating element to go in the ground, the ceiling height to be higher. And what was much more interesting to us than, um, than just the green features is how do people feel in the workplace? So connection to the environment, back to that concept called biophilia. Uh, where do you feel really good working? And how can you raise human health and productivity? One of the little things about the swirl diffusers, the anecdotal evidence is that people feel much more satisfied in the workplace. And then you ask them, do they actually change the swirl diffuser? And they're like, ah, nah. <laughs> but I know I could. And so the perception of comfort has to do with the perception of individual control of your environment rather than waiting for a guy in a gray outfit with a pocket protector and a little silver thing. So this connection environment um, becomes really important to us um, in a larger sense. Where do people, to, to see out onto the horizon line, to see weather systems coming and feel really connected to the world um, and using very, very clear glass as opposed to tinted glass. This cost a lot of energy. Um, the filtered fresh air costs energy. It's a balance between creating the highest quality work environment and doing other things to offset your, your energy and carbon footprint. Um, it just happens to be one of the uh, conference rooms looking back out to Bryant Park. Um, so what do you do to offset that energy uh, cost of floor to ceiling glass? So there's daylight dimming. Typically lights are on or off. They're probably like that here. But it's very easy to, make, to do daylight dimming and sensors which read the daylight, harvest it, and dim down the lighting system. That one technology alone saves about 25% in the cost of lighting. The other thing, the holy grail for all this stuff is getting hard data that, let's call it green buildings. Um, are more productive. So there's a thing called the Hesham Mahone report that showed a 16% rise in children's test scores when educated and tested in daylit environments versus artificial light environments. And we're doing multiple follow-ups because it wasn't good science because we hadn't separated out view. They hadn't separated out view from daylight, from motion, and there's a whole series of things that uh, are following up on that. Um, something that's not very sexy at all, which is commissioning. Um, Typically, skyscrapers are delivered. The people get involved. This is a very, very, very hard way to make a living in New York City. The original designers, the original people who built it all go on to the next job. They pass the building over to the facilities managers. Nothing's vetted properly, and the buildings don't run properly. So to, a lot of times, buildings are designed intelligently and, uh, and then built spasmodically, and then people just uh, leave them and run away, and they're never commissioned. So there's a concept called commissioning, which makes buildings um, operate much, much better. And uh, the idea is, is fine-tuning an instrument. And the project's undergoing the, the fine-tuning of commissioning right now. And that's the building on the skyline. Um, we hope that it will be accepted as one of the great um, New York City uh, skyscrapers. And uh, at the same time, we're trying to explore these issues about housing. Um, how am I doing for time, Luca? Okay. Fifteen minutes left. Fifteen minutes? OK, I'll go through this really, really uh, quickly. This is one of the poorest neighborhoods in the Northeast. Um, median household income is $8,000. And we were designed, we were in a competition to design a, an affordable green house. Um, there were three winners. This house was being built. But we thought the last thing in the world, these shrinking cities, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, Troy, just think of them, or, or the poster child for a shrinking city is Detroit. Most of these cities were built for much larger populations. They peaked in the late 50s and then eventually unraveled. So most of them are at least 20% lower population than they were designed for. 
the, the curbs are there, the traffic lights are there, the sewer systems are all in place, but now um, they're abandoning them. What's greener to re-inhabit these cities or develop some green uh, greenfield site? So I'll, I'll go through this uh, quick. Um, that happens to be the near west side. Um, we started to think about, a lot of these houses are vacant, and we started to think about um, biodiversity in the urban scape. So these were, there was live and there was work. People had a place to work and it was a healthy uh, ecosystem. I don't think it's a stretch to think of uh, cities as ecosystems. Um, I don't know if, if all of you know, but uh, I grew, I'm an upstate New York kid and uh, what I grew up calling the Iroquois Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee, uh, people who build longhouses, had a confederacy across uh, upstate New York. There were five nations. And uh, in, 11, in 1142, they were the first participatory democracy in the New World. So the women elected representatives to go to the Onondaga Nation, which was in Syracuse, and vote for the, and represent them. So w when they sat down to do this vote, they said, in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. So this thought about thinking in a multi-generational thought pattern and that seventh generation consumer products all comes back, um, all comes back to this. They also, um, planted in something called the, the, th the Three Sisters. I'll talk about that in a minute. Buck, Bucky Fuller talked about how houses and buildings and living rooms, we, we, we have all this empty space in our life and we haven't figured out how to use it. And that's how we came up with this idea of a very flexible live-work environment. Um, basically packed everything on one side and this is a completely flexible open loft. Um, this is the basswood model. So this is in the two-bedroom configuration, which was a predicate for the competition. We kind of wrote a narrative that, okay, it's a couple. One of them teaches at the university. One of them is a painter and works at home and has, and has uh, one studio. These are these movable work pods. And then ultimately, they uh, both move out and they run a, a, a studio out of it. Again, back to the, the last thing in the world the place needs is more houses. There's plenty of abandoned houses. But what it needs is diversity and living and working in the, in the neighborhood. Um, we really paid a lot of attention to daylight here. This is uh, the national average of daylight right there of sunny days. This is Syracuse. And, and if you've ever been there, I don't know if, if anybody went to Ithaca. Ithaca's quite, it went to Cornell. Ithaca's very, very similar. They, in Syracuse, they call it Syracusing. And in Ithaca, they call it Ithacating. It's just these dreary days that we get in the late, in the late fall. So we're very interested in how people relate to daylight in their environment. We corrected, uh, created these light tubes following a pattern called biomimicry, coined by another biologist, Janine Benyus, thinking about how it's kind of interesting to relate to the snow. So some of the light tubes are higher than the average snow level. Some are, so you could wake up in the morning and, and know how many inches of snow were outside, by how tall the sky, uh, whether the skylights had been uh, snowed over or not. This is a, a take. Being a suburban kid, it's a, it's a tongue-in-cheek comment on the two-car garage that's open or having come and worked in Tribeca, it's the loading dock. Um, and the pattern of the screen was designed to reflect light and the, the dappled light that falls through a forest canopy. And this is where I think some of the pay dirt is. We know where we feel good. We feel good on a front porch. It's a concept called prospect and refuge. Um, our overhead's covered, our back is protected, and we're prospecting out on the horizon, whether it's visitors or weather systems or enemies. It goes back to something called the Savannah Hypothesis, um, this theory that there's an evolutionary memory of being up elevated. If you ask people their favorite pictures, it almost always has an, is from an elevated position. Water in the foreground, prospecting on the horizon, the Hudson River School. Um, this was designed to reflect as much light as possible into the, into the environment. That screen that you saw is actually out, outside of the project and is capable of closing down at night um, for a kind of secure porch. Okay, now here's, I'll try to get through, th through this one. This is actually the point of the whole thing. I, I don't have a list of attributes that a museum can do, you know, recycle or, you know, do occupancy sensors. Yeah, 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 you need to do all those things. The story is, is that every single person can make a difference. And if I have enough time, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of examples. This is one of my favorite. This is a guy named Kenro Izo. He's a large format photographer. 
and he went to Cambodia to photograph the Angkor Wat temple complexes, was heartbroken by the state of, uh, of health care for children. Post Pol Pot, one of the most devastating uh, situations in, in the world, one of the, one of the most horrible genocides existing. And he, um, he actually found, founds a hospital. So um, Angkor, some scholars say now, is probably the largest temple complex on earth if you include the, uh, the Wats that surround it and the, uh, the berets, the lakes. Um, the western beret that you're looking at over here, that's the easiest to see, is uh, that's it in proportion to Central Park. So this is built in, in the 11th, 12th uh, centuries, uh, all by hand labor. And we have this opportunity to design this tiny little building. So the traditional Khmer building has a vent at the top, and it sheds water off the side. We're experimenting with this kind of modern, clean temple. We want it to be the simplest building we could imagine. This is a little visitor center. This is the project built collecting the rainwater in the center. Um, there's exhibition space, gallery space on the, on, uh, on the building here, uh, a theater to educate people on the, on the story of Ken Roizo and how he founded this, uh, this hospital. And in the center, nothing, just that void uh, of, of water collection. Um, that's it. The idea is that during the daytime, you really don't see into this building. But you can, when you're inside, you look out and you watch the uh, children's hospital under operation. And then at night, when the parents and the children are all inside, the building lights up while you're traveling by. There's a big tourist industry in Cambodia right now. Um, you can look in and, and see the building. And this sparked. So Ken Ro, he had a philanthropist who loved him. They knew about my connection to Cambodia that asked us to come and design the first green building in Cambodia. And this sparked this other project that's now called the Green Initiative. We were trying to knit together healthcare and clean biofuels. There's a plant called Jachofa Kirkus. It's a high nut oil. It's found in, uh, in, in, in a lot of warm, warm climates. Animals don't, uh, don't browse it. So we, try, we, we knit together this uh, biofuels project, or really clean fuels project, based on, on biofuels, micro farming of the Jatropha, outreach into the community, and ultimately supporting healthcare. And the only thing that knit all this together was love for fellow man. Um, this is the project up and running. I could talk for an hour just about how horribly badly this whole project went. Just everything unraveled. We ran into bad things. We planted a plantation, a jatropha. It got overgrown. The people we helped, they stole, they stole our equipment. It just, trying to work in the developing world is so, so hard. And we would, so many times, I gave up, totally gave up. But somebody else from my office picked it up and said, Rick, don't give, don't give up. This is a really cool project. They, they got tired and gave up. Somebody else picked it up. And ultimately, a guy named, uh, uh, another guy from New Hope for Cambodian Children who runs an HIV orphanage, found this engineer who picked it up. And Jatropha had all gone so south on us, even though I still think it's a good idea. But there's a new waste product in, in, uh, in Siem Reap, which is, that never existed before. There's tourist um, restaurants. And they can't get rid of the waste oil fast enough because uh, their clientele expect clean oil, and there was never any waste oil. It just got cycled down. So we converted the whole thing over to a waste vegetable oil process, and uh, that's Basil Stamos right there, the donor. He's a good guy. And uh, ultimately, this, it's all about the children and making a difference with health care. This is at the opening of... Uh, of the visitor center. And right now, the Sienek Hospital uh, in Phnom Penh, which is the best adult care hospital in Cambodia, is completely fueled off of biofuel. All their vehicles are fueled off of biofuel. The uh, Anger Hospital for Children on the visitor center is completely fueled off of biofuel. All of their vehicles are now off of biofuel. So the guy I showed you, Basil Stamos, was giving money to help health care in Siem Reap. And one of the things he would have done was fund a a really dirty diesel-powered genset to produce the energy, polluting the neighborhood, making the kids sick. Like, doesn't, doesn't really make any sense. So because Ken Roizo cared enough about the kids, he founded a hospital. Because Basil cared enough, he dragged somebody else in. Because we got off on this crazy benevolent, there will be blood story of, of Jatropha, and that unraveled. But, but another person picked up the ball, and then ultimately this thing is happening. It's, it's actually going ahead. So um, 
That brings to the point, rather than a list of things that you guys could do here specifically, it, this is our office. Um, this is in uh, National Geographic. This is our green roof. We were the first LEED Platinum project in New York State, New York City, under something called LEED CI. The green roof that we planted wouldn't have made any difference whether we did it or didn't do it. It would have made no difference. But if you ask us what one thing would we do all over again, it would be the green roof. And the editor of uh, of National Geographic said about green roofs in general, here's where being responsible and attuned to the environment pairs up with spiritual satisfaction. And uh, that's really the, the point that I want to make. Thank you for bearing with me through all of that. The point I want to make is I, I could come and talk to you about what a museum could and should and would do, you know, energy profile, carbon footprint, all of those things. But I think the real story is I, I'm, I'm just a kid from upstate New York and, and ended up doing the second tallest building in New York, clearly the greenest skyscraper in America. And it's not because really set out to do it. It's because one person talked to another person, Douglas Durst did four, four times square. Um, my partner, Bob Fox, worked with him on that. Ken Roizo decides to provide health care. Now all of that's, uh, there's a biofuels project up and running. So my point, and uh, hopefully this is, is clear, is I think we have a moral, ethical, even spiritual, court obligation to rethink the way that we do things. And if each one of you in each one of your lives and your work here, keep that in mind, you'll do the right things. And who knows but that it won't spark somebody else on, onto something else. I'll give you one example. Upstairs you have floor. And your exhibit, which is fantastic by the way, I loved it. Um, your exhibit is a great exhibit. At the end it talks about a list of attributes that make it sustainable in a whole little list. So this is recycled content. And it tells the story of Floor, which happens to be an interface carpet product. And it says 80% recycled content. That's great. That's really good. But the story of that is so much richer. The story is that uh, a friend of ours, really close friend who I can't remember her name, um, worked, worked for Interface for this guy named Ray Anderson. And she's a very busy single mom. And she was coming home one night with the groceries. And her daughter was in college in an environmental science program. And she said, Mom, plastic bags, you know what these do in landfills? You've got to stop this. This is crazy. And she said, listen, I'm a single mom. I'm working really, really hard. I'm doing everything I can. Plastic bags are OK with me. They're convenient. They're light. And, uh, and so her daughter gave her a book called Natural Capitalism, written by Paul Hawken. And uh, she read it and had an epiphany. And she gave it to her boss named Ray Anderson. Ray Anderson reads Natural Capitalism, meets, meets Paul Hawken, and gathers his entire carpet tile company together and said, I'm going to risk everything. We're going to fundamentally rechange. I'm one of the problems. We're a petroleum-based company. I am the robber baron of the modern era. And we're going to risk everything and reinvent the way we're going to run our carpet company. Well, that company is Interface Carpet. Tile. He's now Ray is one of the most requested speakers out there. He has a series of books out, and he fundamentally rethought how you use carpet. We think of it as a product, and he rethought it. And he said, "People don't want to own carpet; they just want to walk on stuff. And when they're done with it, they want to get rid of it." And he kind of rethought what a carpet was. It's not that it's 80 percent um, post-consumer recycled. It's the fact that he's loaning it to you. That when you're done with it, you give it back to him and he recycles it again. The idea is he reinvented what this thing that we got used to was. Not just that he uses a different type of material, but he rethought how we do things in the world. And PS Interface Carpet Tile, even through the recession, did, did extremely well. So again, not to harp on it, it's do everything that you think makes sense. Talk to everybody about it. Every single person can have an incalculable um, impact on the world. So thank you. I think we have time for a couple of questions. OK. Great. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Questions? No questions? We had a, a rather nice little similar story um, last week. Um, we had the first of our design talks, and um, Michael Barut and uh, Eve uh, Ludwig came along to talk about the design of our catalog for the triennial. Uh -huh. And that's the greenest book we've ever done. Pentagram, right? Yes. Uh -huh. Um, and uh, um, we had a panel afterwards with uh, Chuck, who's a uh, one-person production outfit for our, our book materials, mm -hmm. who made sure it was the greenest catalog we ever done. Mm -hmm. And Matilda, we're um, up here talking with the designers about uh, the sort of thinking behind it. 
Um, and uh, one of the people in the audience noticed that in this panel we had these tables set out and on it were glasses and a jug of water. Mm -hmm. And he was so impressed by the fact there was no plastic bottles there mm -hmm. that he sent uh, an email this morning to the secretary of the Smithsonian, um, Wayne, and, uh, and said uh, he'd been here for this great thing about sustainability and he wanted to point out the fact that we weren't throwing away plastic bottles. I thought that was rather nice. <laughs> Anyway, we've got several th questions here. As an architect, how much do you get involved in the interior? Um, because obviously there's a key area where probably more than material get used. Right. Um, it depends on the project. But uh, for example, the Bank of America Tower, we did the building and what's called the core <laughs> and shell, the elevator lobbies and the toilet rooms and the lobby. and, and that. And what I didn't show was the Henry Miller's Theater, um, which is now going renamed the Stephen Sondheim, where we did the entire interior. But in a commercial office building, um, uh, an, another fir other firms typically do the interior. So Gensler did the Bank of America build out. Um, Al Gore's office, um, Al Gore's office also achieved lead platinum under commercial interiors. And uh, that was done by a guy named Kevin Smith, who also did the USGBC headquarters in Washington, a really great, really great interior designer. And then our office was interiors. But we did the Henry Miller's Theater, if you have a chance to go there. And that will probably, although that use profile isn't set up at all under this rating system, it'll, it'll, it looks like it's going to achieve lead gold. But uh, off-gassing in the environment is a, is a huge issue. And the materials that you bring in. I see Matilda. Mm -hmm. Well, two things. Um, my my favorite thing to talk about, besides that each person can make a difference, the second number two, is that I believe I started out as a preservationist. Um, and kind of stumbled into the environmental movement, you know, even though being a kid of the 60s and 70s. Um, I think they're two sister ethics. So if you say the preservation community, conservation, preservation, museums, um, are involved essentially with being wise stewards of a rich resource which was left to you by, from a previous generation, your role is to be a wise steward of it and leave it better for the next generation. Um, that's the conservation preservation movement. That's exactly the environmental movement, exact on a, on a different scale. So I think they're very directly related. So um, what's so green about a skyscraper in the middle of Manhattan, previously disturbed site, mass transit? What's so green about trying to operate an existing building? It's an existing building. So all the embodied energy is here. So I, I think that, um, that historic preservation and the environmental movement are perfectly paired. There are just things that we don't fully understand. So from my background, if you go and throw insulation at the problem, this is why I didn't say, here's things you can do. If you throw insulation into a, build, into a building like this, if you said, oh, well, knee-jerk reaction, cut energy use, and that's the whole thing, you could destroy the building just essentially destroy the building. The building is, is in a state of balance for vapor transmission, and, heat, and it relies on heat loss into the facade to off-gas the, the moisture that's in it at a certain rate, and the building's in some kind of balance. To just go and fundamentally change that could destroy the historic building fabric. So I think it's just a very difficult problem, but that's why I talk about not cut your energy profile in a building like this. It's have an attitude about sustainability that approaches each thing and see what you can do. Not all of them, um, not all of them work well, although I would think you're co protecting your collection and, uh, and a good envelope are totally consistent. Um, so we're doing a project right now for the, for the Rudin family, and it was built in 1941. So, and it's, it's empty, and we're going to do a new condo inside of it. And uh, we chose not to re-insulate the walls, because at some point, we couldn't tell what would happen to the historic building fabric if we cut off 
the thermal transmission that's going in the wall. On the other hand, we're removing steel sash windows and doing you know, what I hope to be the nicest window replacement on Earth with insulating glass because we can do that with modern technology that would keep the condensation from the steel sash from wetting the surfaces and wrecking the existing surfaces and actually protect the building. So I think each one, you need to attack it and no knee-jerk reactions. Yes. One more. Um, some of the staff members have noticed that usually after um, daytime in the cafeteria, it seems like there's a lot of food waste, and we were trying to figure out different ways that we could address that. But, I mean, some of us trying to be really conscientious about sorting out our plastic waste from our food waste from our paper waste. Is there anything that we can do about the food waste? I mean, is there ever going to be possibility of yeah. composting on site? Well, there's a, there's a couple things. And this is, uh, so the, the big... The, the big thing that you guys could do, from my opinion, is not recycling and composting. We're all doing that, and you need to do that. But you're the, you're the Cooper Hewitt. Like, we pay attention to what you say. The world pays attention, the Smithsonian. So you're part of a much larger network that's really powerful, and you can get messages out there. So you're, you're basically a message, messaging institution. So there's a thing called an anaerobic digester. It's hard to make financial sense out of it as a standalone. In fact, at the Bank of America Tower, we're going to do it. Cafeteria waste and paper waste both can go into something called an anaerobic digester. It produces methane gas, and from that methane gas, you can produce power. Um, it's, the payback was past 10 years, and they were still going to do it. But um, the problem was that uh, uh, putting uh, banking paperwork into an anaerobic digester is not one of the accepted methods of getting rid of ba <laughs> banking records. And it, Somebody can go and it, dig around. It, it fell apart. <laughs> well, there, there are certain things. You can incinerate it, you can shred it, you can do certain things, but anaerobic digester didn't exist, and it's like a one year process to get a new way of getting rid of waste paper from a banking institution. So, what I would say is, this is a really cool thing. You know, school children thinking about um, food waste together with paper waste, and even you know the whole the whole um, the whole Fifth Avenue corridor of museums who all have cafeterias, not just yours, but could you aggregate all of this food waste and paper waste? I mean, I, I, I can imagine an institution like this has a tremendous amount of paper waste. Also, you mix those together and fund anaerobic digester at any one of the institutions, connect it with an electric vehicle that's charged by solar power, and, and aggregate it. And now you really could make power, and you really could do something. And it, and it sends a message. And this is a Bill McDonough thing, but, uh, but, but waste is food. So you can take waste and make it a fuel, as opposed to just be less bad. So that the theory is cut the energy in half is is being half as bad. But, um, but planting a green roof is actually taking over a hot tar beach and re-knitting piece of the ecosystem, reducing local heat island effect. It's about something a lot more than a little bit of stormwater capture. So you're taking waste, and you could compost it, which is good. You could recycle your waste, which is good. Or you could create fuel from it, which is, and, and not release methane gas out into the atmosphere, which is what happens at landfill. And now you're actually on the good side. You actually just reinvented the whole formula. So I would really encourage you to, to aggressively attack the problems. Like, isn't there other answers besides just compost or just recycle? Yeah, that's really what I meant when I, at the beginning when I talked about the bottom up and the top down. I think if we think about what we can do right now today, it's, it, pretty, it pretty much is a bottom up thing. You know, we, we have a committee, we can work on ways that each of us can contribute to making things a little better from the way we are right now. But because of this influence that Rick talks about, um, we have this opportunity also to have a top-down approach where we might be able to help tell the story to a broader audience or make a bigger difference about systemic issues or use the broader resources of the Smithsonian. So I think we want to do both at the same time, um, individuals but also collectively. So anyway, thank you so much for the inspiration. You're very welcome. Thank you.